This is the first of a series of lectures about Federal Reserve policy or monetary policy. This is part one of probably five or six parts. The end has not yet been created. And this part is about money, credit, and its creation, and is an, intro and is an introduction to the Federal Reserve System and an introduction to the official definition of money. Now, here's what we're going to try to accomplish in this multi-part video lecture series. First, we're going to start today with the structure and mandate of the Federal Reserve System. Then we're going to today also explore money, credit, and velocity and the connection between them. Then the most important lecture in this series, and this will be the second lecture, will be a discussion of open market operations at a simple introductory level. Then an equally important component for understanding topical events in the pandemic of 2020 will be a more advanced treatment of open market operations and how they're being used in 2020. That's followed by a discussion of the impact of open market operations upon interest rates and interest rate targets. And then we're going to go back in history a little bit and take a look at the details and complications of the Federal Reserve policy that was exercised between 2007 and 2019 because that's an evolving story that makes it difficult to understand the current story unless you understand that historical buildup. And then finally we get around to talking about uh, current Federal Reserve policy being used right now in the spring of 2020. And we finally conclude with the long-term dangers of short-term policy. Because even though this policy is working reasonably well, in fact, it's doing a great deal to help alleviate problems in the economy, almost essential to that, there are some substantial long-term repercussions of the policies pursued today. And so we conclude with that. Let's start by discussing the structure of the Federal Reserve System. Now, the Federal Reserve System is our nation's central banking authority, or simply our central bank. All countries have an equivalent central bank, and this website that's cited here is where you go to look at the others. The picture I have here is of the European Union's European Central Bank, and its spectacular logo out in front, I guess. The present chair of the Federal Reserve System is Jerome Powell, in the center picture here, who replaced Janet Yellen, who's obviously there on the left, who in turn replaced Ben Bernanke, uh, who's on the right there, and who replaced Alan Greenspan, whose picture is not shown. These people are very powerful people, especially right now. Uh, Jerome Powell is a remarkably powerful individual, can uh, initiate policies that can make or break this economy to some extent. We're not going to be talking much about them. That's for another kind of class or a political science class or something. We're going to be talking about the institutions and its operations that they manage. Uh, primary policy decisions are determined by the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. And so when you hear news about this big ambitious new policy to uh, support the commercial paper markets, for example, or the repo market, those primary decisions come from the Board of Governors and are voted on by the Board of Governors. And uh, we're going to mostly be focusing on the operational branch of the Federal Reserve System, pictured here in a meeting some years ago, which is responsible for controlling the money supply and influencing interest rates. This is the policy execution branch of the Federal Reserve System, and it's literally called the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC, and it's located at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is one of the 12 district banks located in the United States. And as we say, they conduct open market operations. So there is considerably more that I could say about the Federal Reserve System or its history or its composition. I just mentioned the 12 district banks, for example, but I don't say very much about them and what their duties are. This sort of thing you can... Uh, research by initially, for example, going to Wikipedia and simply looking up the Federal Reserve System, and there you will find a much more detailed account of the institution itself. 
Our job here is to get right into a discussion of policy and the way it's executed because that alone is sufficient to take up two to three weeks of class time. So let's start looking at the means to do that. Now the organizational chart, as I suggested in the previous slide, starts with the Board of Governors at the very top, which is responsible for managing the 12 district banks. If you're here in California, we're in the San Francisco district uh, of the Federal Reserve System. But the part that we care about is the part on the right side of this slide, the Federal Open Market Committee, again in New York, and that committee interprets the rules that are passed down by the Board of Governors as to what it means in terms of operations, and then they give orders to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York System Account Supervisor, who then instructs people to trade at the open market trading desk. Now that is what we're going to mostly be focusing on in the second and third lecture. We go back to more general policy in the final lectures in this sequence, but to understand anything about the Federal Reserve System, you have to understand their key primary uh, tool that they use, which is open market operations. We can begin by discussing the Federal Reserve mandate, which is what they're supposed to do based upon their 1913 charter and how over years that has been expanded some. Now first, their primary job and the reason that they were created was to promote bank and financial institution stability. They need to keep the banks operating. Prior to their foundation in 1913, bank failures was a significant problem in the United States. And the thrust to create a central bank came from the recession of 1907, where there were a large number of bank failures. Now, initially, the Federal Reserve System wasn't all that successful at keeping banks alive, because as you probably remember from comments made elsewhere in the class, in uh, 1930, during the Great Depression, one third of all banks failed despite the activities of the Federal Reserve System, and another third were absorbed by the third largest banks in the so-called banking holiday of actually not 1930, 1932. The conditions that began to set that in motion came from the stock market crash of 29 and went through 30, 31, and 32. Now, however, as we remember from the mortgage meltdown, the Federal Reserve System is capable of saving individual banking institutions, although under certain circumstances will nonetheless let them fail. Their primary job historically, though, has been these things that are circled in the gray box, or outlined in the gray box, I should say. Their primary job is as an anti-inflation mechanism, although that's not currently very relevant. Their job is to promote price stability, and that implies do what is necessary to prevent inflation. One might say, well, what about deflation? Well, deflation was not thought to be a modern problem until recently, but now it would have to be said if deflation were to be a seriously emerging problem that they would see it as their job to prevent that from happening. They also have the job of promoting interest rate stability, and that turns these days to be trans turns out to these days to be translated into low interest rates. So their job is to keep interest rates relatively stable. But since uh, 2007 or so, that has been interpreted to mean rock bottom interest rates. And that is actually not their mandate, but that's what they've been doing. Now we'll see later in the lecture that these two mandates are sometimes mutually exclusive. And by that I mean that if you're trying to promote interest rate stability by, for example, keeping interest rates low, Episodes from history tell us that if you pursue that problem for too long a period of time, you're going to have inflation. And that's the sense in which the simultaneous successful execution of these two goals is impossible or nearly difficult, if not impossible. We'll come back to that when time permits at the appropriate point in the lectures. They have another mandate to promote international financial stability which normally implies stable or relatively stable exchange rates and has no other meaning beyond that. And there is a vague reference in their charter to promote full employment. These days, that seems to be a charter to save the economy and even save the stock market, because basically that's what they've been doing literally since the year 2000. 
So we're going to mostly emphasize the, uh, the, the contradictory or exclusive, mutually exclusive, components of their mandate that is in the box, in the gray box, but we are going to talk about the others as well, in particular, of course, the bottom one, promote full employment and save the economy, save the stock market, or however that's interpreted, because that is, of course, underway at the current time. Now, the Federal Reserve System has three primary weapons in their toolkit. Now, the first one formally is called discount window lending, and we'll see later that that's when banks are able to come to the Federal Reserve System to borrow reserves, specifically. We'll just say at the moment, borrow money. They have a much, much, I have the word, or equivalent there, because they have a much, much expanded sense of that definition these days, because their capacity to lend directly to banks and using banks as intermediaries literally lend directly to corporations and others is part of the common day and certainly part of the 2020 emergency toolkit. And so this is used extensively for emergencies and is being used extensively on an unprecedented scale for emergencies now. We'll end with that because you can't understand how they're doing it until you understand how open market operations work. They can change their reserve requirement. And I'll just say for the moment that's seldom done, uh, especially for policy purposes. And we'll come back and explore that after we understand open market operations, because everything that we talk about will be tied to this very critical, all important, almost exclusive policy that they actually are able to use, open market operations, which are done many times per week throughout the year and is at the core of all of their other policy moves. And that's why the second lecture, which is how these things work, are so critical. You may recall that in previous lectures, we've used the loanable funds model. And we said that the Federal Reserve System has the ability to increase the supply of credit to the economy. But that sounded like kind of a magic box when I was talking about it. I didn't explain anything about how they could do it. They do it through open market operations. And that's how we are going to come finally to understand that sense that they can shift the aggregate supply curve to the right. Now, I need to introduce a little bit of abstraction here, and I'll explain and apply this later as time goes on. But this describes, to some extent, one of the operational problems that are faced by the Federal Reserve System. It's largely an execution and operations agency through open market operations through the Open Market Committee. The Federal Reserve Board of Governors tends to set broad and encompassing economic goals. They can't directly do anything to affect those goals. You can with fiscal policy, at least theoretically, but you can't with monetary policy. Instead, all they are trying to do or all they can hope to do is to hit intermediate variable targets of the kind I'm going to describe and hope that by hitting those intermediate variable targets that they will accomplish their economic goals. But they can't even affect their target variables. An engineer would really love this kind of description of a policy mandate. The only thing they can affect are the control variables over which they have direct control. Now I know for you that this right now is very abstract. What do you mean? <laughs> This is, however, a t an odd type of management problem where you have a vastly powerful agency that has very important and all-encompassing economic goals that they know they can strongly influence, but they can't control them directly. Think of it as an engineering pro uh, uh, program where you're trying to uh, program a little toy boat or something like that, but you have no means to control the boat directly. Instead, you have to control it by affecting other things like the direction the wind is blowing or something like that. And so they have target variables that they know has an impact upon the economic goals, but they can't control those target variables either directly. They can only do so indirectly by controlling what it is they in fact can control. Now, this will be a little more clear when we point out what some of these examples are for the economic goals the target variables, and the control variables. The goal 
typically is price targets, as we've said, anti-inflation targets, uh, preventing prices from going into deflation. They now, of course, to some extent, at least implicitly, target real GDP growth. They want to keep that positive. They contribute not as much as fiscal policy does, but do contribute to maintaining high employment and low unemployment rates. And of course, they exclusively have a target of maintaining strong financial stability, keeping the uh, banks, for example, from bankruptcy. But these days, this is also interpreted at times at least as keeping a strong stock market and a healthy bond market, as we're going to see in the last few lectures. But nothing the Federal Reserve System does can control these variables directly. They don't have the right, nor should they, to set price targets per se. They can't say the inflation rate we decree will be 3%. They even have less control over the real GDP growth rate. They can't mandate that the real T GDP growth rate be 6.5%. And the same thing is true of unemployment. And since they have typically a laissez-faire attitude towards banks, they let them run on their own resources for most of the time. They don't even have control over that unless the system is in crisis. So this is a sense in which we mean they don't have any control directly over the goal variables that are so important to their policy. Instead, they set these target variables like these shown here by changing the money supply. And the M1 and M2 means, before we can talk about that, we have to define what the money supply is. By changing credit and debt measures and generally making credit more or a little bit less available, which through open market operations they're going to be able to do, and using the same devices, open market operations, affecting interest rates. So, therefore, they have some control over that. But the Federal Reserve System, for example, with regard to interest rates, does not have the fiat ability to declare interest rates. They don't even have the right to do that for the federal funds rate, which is why they set the federal funds rate, their primary target interest rate, in ranges as a target instead of at a specific target. And they certainly don't directly control the money supply. That may surprise you to hear that. And they don't directly control credit and debt measures. Instead, what they do control is the level of bank reserves, which is so far a concept that you're not uh, able to understand. This is going to be explained in the lectures on open market operations. I have that one line crossed out because they used to control a variable called the monetary base and they did that for a very long time, but for the largest part now, they're neglecting that statistic for various reasons. So we won't cover that. We'll talk about bank reserves only. Now, the channel in which this influence is supposed to move from the control variable to the target variable to the goal in the literature is called the transmission mechanism. This is the transmission mechanism, one might say, used by the Federal Reserve System. And one economist might argue that the appropriate target variable for the most effective transmission mechanism is the money supply growth rate, whereas another economist might say, no, that's not nearly as effective as the credit growth rate. And possibly a third economist will say, actually what matters most is their impact upon interest rates. And all three would agree that all of that matters to some extent. The question is, which is the one on which the Federal Reserve should be focused? Now, these days, it's largely the second and the third, the growth of credit and the level of interest rates, or specifically the one abbreviated FFR, federal fund rate. Now, when you say, well, why don't they just use the one that works the best? Well, that's the problem. It's hard to determine which is working the best because there's so much slippage between each of these levels, as I'm going to try to demonstrate in this lecture. With goals, the real objective is to prevent or mitigate abnormalities or excesses like high inflation, recession, or high interest rates. But before they can do that, they have to ask how strong and reliable are these connections in the transmission mechanism? Which chain of events does, in fact, work best? And they also have to be cognizant of the fact that some work well under certain circumstances and others under different circumstances. So much of the rest of this discussion is going to be about that specific issue.
And we're going to start by asking the question, what is money? And so this is me at one of the Smithsonian museums many years ago, standing next to a coin. And this is the Yap Islander coin. And when I was young, I read the an interesting story about the Yap Islanders and this coin. And it was I didn't know it was in the Smithsonian, so I was shocked when I walked in and saw this. So I got about five pictures of myself standing next to this coin because it's such a great story. Because it means that money is whatever you make it out to be. Money is whatever satisfies the primary criteria of money and is something that we all agree is money. Now, there has to be a social consensus to a considerable part on what constitutes money. And that's what this story is about. And I'll tell it to you very quickly. Before the uh, explorers came and ruined the life of the Yap Islanders, they had an archipelago economy that had a lot of trade between the islands. And apparently some of the islands that were larger and more prosperous had a positive balance of trade surplus with some of the other islands. As the story goes, part of this may be apocryphal, but it's the story as I remember reading it, um, a problem arose because one island was accumulating a surplus, the other was persistently running a deficit, but it turned out the deficit island owned this coin, and they used rock coins that were round, approximately round, that was not all that round, but with, uh, with holes in the center of various sizes, the larger the coin, the more wealth it represented. So I guess the committee to resolve the uh, tension between Island 1 and Island 2 said, you know what we can do? We can satisfy this deficit if we ship the coin from the deficit island to the surplus island. And being amiable people, I presume, they all celebrated, decided to physically transfer the coin, and that would be the end of the controversy and the strife. As the story goes, they attached the coin to a raft, they went out into the straits between the island and the raft was a bit unstable and the coin sank to the bottom of the strait in only about 35 feet of water. First, apparently, this part probably is apocryphal, there was a great deal of agony and concern because they had lost so much wealth. And then someone cleverly suggested that they simply audit the coin on a regular basis, say once a year, and make sure that the records refer to who owns the coin and who does not. And so they thought, well, that's a good idea. Uh, so because we still don't have a problem if we can say that the uh, deficit island played the surplus island with this coin. It doesn't matter this at the bottom of the strait. It's not practically useful anyway. So all we have to do is like paddle out once a year, once every six months, and go down and make sure the coin is there and remember who owns the coin, and that will solve the problem. And see, that's at least partly a true story, because it's, I remember even told on this little, <laughs> little plaque right there in front of it, but uh, all it means is there has to be a bit of a social histrionic to agree to what constitutes money. Now, when I give that lecture to uh, the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency aficionados, they think that's very good news, and to some extent it is. You don't have to have any hardcore physical presence. The coin, of course, is a hardcore physical presence, but you can declare bookkeeping entries to be money. I like this quote from James Gleick from the book he wrote called The Information, and where he argued some, you know, that money doesn't really exist. It just kind of seems like it does. So he writes this. He says, economics is an information science. Now that money itself is completing a development arc from matter to bits stored to computer memory and magnetic strips, world finance coursing through the global nervous system, even when money seems to be material treasure, heavy in pockets and ships holds and bank vaults, it was merely information. And that's all money has to be to be money is information, he argues. Coins and notes, shekels and calories are all just short-lived technologies for tokenizing information about who owns what. And this, of course, is what makes uh, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, advocates that these things can be money enthused because basically anything, including bookkeeping entries that are well administered, can very well serve as money. We're going to see when we get to open market operations that our money supply consists of precisely that.
bookkeeping entries of information and absolutely nothing whatsoever aside from that. We'll come back to that point here in just a minute. So as we know, the brain from peeking in the brain knows that the ruler of this world will eventually be controlling his empire from a smartphone, running an algo, controlling bookkeeping entries. However, before we can declare something to be money, we have to give money a definition to see what financial assets meet the billing. It is going to be the case that whatever you define as money, tautologically and definitionally, is going to be a financial asset. Because anything that satisfies the criteria of money is by definition a financial asset. So first of all, it has to be something that is stable as a medium of exchange. And that is, that simply means that in transactions, especially with other monies, it can't just be wildly flopping all around and changing values considerably. It can trend, but it can't trend with volatility. Related to that is it has to be a store of value, meaning that if you decide for a while to not use it for exchange purposes and just hold on to it, then for the largest part, it satisfies that criteria. But for a financial asset to qualify as money, the store of value must be relatively constant. That turns out to be actually one of the problems with using cryptocurrencies. Their value in their exchange primary currency is very volatile, far too volatile to be used currently as a universal money. To solve that problem, somebody's going to have to come up with an algorithm or a different design that stabilizes the uh, currency in question. I've noticed that Ethereum kind of is closer to satisfying that quality, but in recent months, uh, these cryptocurrencies have all been bouncing around crazily. You can't have your money supply doing that. So that's a, a task that has to be satisfied by those working on that kind of problem. But they might very well solve it. Finally, it has to be a means to settle debt and it has to be universally acceptable uh, to everyone who uses it. So everybody has to agree, yeah, I, can, I, I owe you a debt. What will you accept? This is what I accept. Everybody has to agree that the named instrument, which these days is, say, a check, that is, however, written against a monetary deposit in a bank, for which, for example, you can get some cash. That's how it's resolved. So basically, we argue that these three criteria have to be satisfied before any financial asset can count as money. And that's why many financial assets are automatically disqualified. Could you use SPY stock, for example, SPY, as money, or stock in General Motors as money? The answer is no, it's not stable and it's not, it is a store of value, but it has to be a store of value at a fairly consistent value. The value can't fluctuate up and down and uh, it can't be used as a means to settle debt. You can't normally settle a debt by passing on your ownership of General Motors stock to someone else. They'll say, sell the stock, give me money, and then give me the money. The term legal tender refers to circulating money that can be used to pay obligations to the United States government. That's what that term actually means. Uh, in the United States, coins are not included in that. So if you owe taxes to the IRS and you want to get even with them for charging you too much taxes, you can't send them bags of pennies to satisfy that debt, which has been tried. You can't send them coins at all to satisfy the debt. Coins are not legal tender in the United States. Most money today is in the form of bookkeeping transactions, and we have to pause on that to make sure that you understand that. We're right back to the issue that money is not real. Money doesn't actually exist in this economy. You know, that's a bizarre thing to say. I have money in my own account. What do you mean you have money in your own account? All you have is a bookkeeping ledger. That's all you have that records you have money in that account. So it's got debits and credits, and when you, say, write a check, if you write a check or you send a balance to the bank, you credit or debit the account, depending on what you're doing. And the bank has exactly the same equivalent. They have their own set of books that is presumably matching yours. Well, bookkeeping entries are not money, and those bookkeeping entries are not money. What they are is evidence of the existence of an intangible money that doesn't actually exist in any meaningful sense. It is actually the records of the money 
that serve to allow us to pass these record back and forth in a very systematic way that is that has social compliance that allows us to believe that we're using money when in fact there's actually nothing there. To make that point, there's another anecdotal story I'll tell you. When uh, this was a long time ago, the 70s, if I recall, that uh, some robbers, some thieves in San, San Francisco, found out that the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, which is District 12, our district in California, had a lot of money. Uh, they do in the form of reserve credits as bookkeeping entries. And so they literally decided to rob the bank. Now, it's been 10 years since I've been in that bank, so it may not look like this anymore. But when you walk into the bank, there's very substantial security there. Now, uh, the bank doesn't have, however, much that you can carry out. Part of the reason for the security is to just prevent people who don't know what the hell they're doing from coming in there to rob a bank that doesn't have any money. As the story goes, and I remember reading this story, so it's not apocryphal, they rushed in there with their weapons and they said, where's the money? And they said, well, we don't actually keep any real money here. They do keep Federal Reserve notes there, but not, not very much apparently. And so eventually they persuaded these guys that the money was actually in, represented by a group of mainframe computers that were in the basement. And the money consisted of, as Gleek said, these little bits of information on back in those days, computer tapes that said, yeah, sure, this bank has like $16 billion in assets all of it as recorded bookkeeping entries. So therefore, when you define or control the money supply in a country like the United States or any modern country today, you're simply talking about defining and controlling bookkeeping entries and nothing else. Now, once again, if you're a big aficionado of Bitcoin or Ethereum or the newer coins, you're saying that isn't all that different. The blockchain is kind of a ledger. It is, it is a ledger, it's not kind of a ledger. It, it does the same thing, it keeps the records. Uh, that's very similar to the way money's managed in the world today, real government money that people say call the dollar. Absolutely, it's identical actually, except the record keeping mechanism is very, very different. And the, of course the creation of the money is way different because in our case, as we're gonna see with open market operations, the Federal Reserve System, um, the Federal Reserve System uses open market operations to control the creation of these bookkeeping entries, whereas the purpose of cryptocurrency is to waste copious amounts of electricity to do exactly the same thing. Okay, so once you recognize that you have to deal with financial assets, all of which are recorded as bookkeeping entries, because this is also true of stocks and bonds, if you buy a stock today, then all you get is a something that tells you you bought the stock. You don't actually ever get the physical printed stock anymore. Uh, it's it's a, bit, a little bit less true of bonds. You can still get bearer bonds that are actually physical bonds, but for the largest part, when you buy bonds, uh, it's the same way, bookkeeping entries. Okay, these are the official definitions of money. You can't include bonds because they're not used to settle debt. You can't include stocks, so what can you include? Now, the Federal Reserve System has tinkered with the definitions of money since their inception, and they're never quite satisfied with it. Right now, they have two effective definitions, M1 and M2. Up until a few years ago, about five years ago, they had a third one called M3. They finally got rid of that. They said, no, nah, that's just not working. Okay, so what is M1? It's the sum of all currency in circulation which includes the dollar bills, the $100 bills, the $20 bills that we're all carrying around and that are in tills and so forth. Federal Reserve notes, those are called. And if you look on the front of yours, you'll see it is not an obligation of the United States Treasury. It is the obligation of a Federal Reserve District Bank. It says so right on the stamp on the front of the dollar bill. If you look at uh, that stamp and it has a 12, that means it's a liability of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Pull out a dollar bill and take a look at it. Those count as money, obviously. Checking deposits count as money. So whatever balance you have in your checking account, that counts as part of the money supply out there. Traveler's checks, because they're similar, and other checkable deposits, uh, such as a checkable deposit on your time account if you're a member of a credit union, for example. So mostly, in other words, checkable deposits, the bulk of which are simply what we call checking accounts. Now, they also have a, a definition called M2, which is inclusive 
in that it includes the definition of M1. So everything that's in M1 is also in M2, but adds to that retail money market, future, money market mutual fund balances. Money market mutual funds being a type of savings asset that mutual funds offer that are investing in very short-term assets and are typically checkable because they're checkable and easily converted to liquidity to a, a means of spending. They're counted as money in M2, but not M1. Savings deposits, including money market deposits, and small time deposits. So if you have, these things are diminishing in importance except for the money market mutual fund holdings. So uh, if you have a time deposit and a savings deposit, it's counted as M2, but not M1. Now, when we get to the question of, well, how big is this? There's the most recent issue of the so-called H6 release here on the in the center of the page. And that's in part of the statistical database that allows the Federal Reserve and others, including us, to look at the size of the money supply and various debt measures. And we can see that given the definition of M1, in February 2020, there was about $4 trillion of these assets in use. And it had grown rather substantially since the previous year by 6.8%. So about $4 trillion of these financial assets that the Federal Reserve classifies as M1 in circulation at about the time I made this video. Of the M2, which is far more inclusive, as you can see, there's $15.5 trillion, and that had gone through an even higher growth rate of 7.4%. Now, why? This is kind of boring, right? So why is it so important? Because if you have a target variable to control the money supply growth rate, that variable's worthless unless you can monitor the money supply growth rate and see what it's doing. And that you can't do unless you define the specific financial assets that make up the money, that make up the money supply, whether M1 or M2, and you have to ignore the growth of all other assets. And therefore, what they count, it really matters a lot when we say, well, the growth of the money supply was 6.8%, you're saying the money supply, how measured? This way. Currency, Federal Reserve notes, checking deposits, traveler's checks, and other checkable deposits. That's what I meant, one might say. Now, when you look at the money stock measures, between uh, those two, uh, the dotted one is M2, and the solid one that's a, almost a straight trend line is M1. M2's on the... Uh, left ordinate and M1's on the right ordinate. And you can see that M2 is sort of slumped and then caught up and went above, kind of, although we're using different axes on this, of course. And we can see that this is not at all very interesting. But remember, the Federal Reserve System never going to have the target of controlling the money supply per se. They're going to be interested in targeting the money supply growth rate. Now, this is about the time you want to start thinking back to the macro sim models that we used, especially the more advanced applications of the macro sim model. Because remember, we were running that model trying to influence the economy, just like this uh, transmission mechanism that I'm suggesting here with that model. Because one of the things you were doing was changing the money supply growth rate, remember? And we were saying, well, you can either be the credit growth rate or the money supply growth rate, and that's why it matters. They're different from each other. One may work, the other may not work. And that's the transmission uh, mechanism question of the, of the century. When we take a look at the money supply growth rate, even when it's smooth, and which we're showing that as being smoothed by uh, the, the dotted lines, then it's extremely volatile far more important, it does not have any clear connection to what is going on in the economy. And if there is a connection, it appears to be the direction of cause and effect is going from the economy to the money supply, not so much from the money supply to the economy. Look at the top of this graph very carefully. And we're saying this is a period where we have a speculative expansion, a bad recession, a speculative expansion, a bad reception, and tepid growth. And take a look at even the smooth average of the M1 money supply to that, through that period. Now, M2 is a little more stable. But 
in the case of M1, it has a peak of 18%, and that was in 2011. It, remember, we were asking the question, inflation is caused by too much money chasing too few goods? Well, even M2 was peaking around that same time. Do you recall that we had a bad inflation in 2011? No, we actually had the opposite. Prices were uh, going into deflation in 2011. Going back a few years before that, in 2007, 2008, there was a bit in 2004 and 5 a real estate expansion, but this isn't peaking back then. This is peaking later in 2008, 2009, when those real estate prices were coming tumbling down. And here we have both measures of the money supply peaking. So again, as I pointed out way back when we were talking about the loanable funds model, if anyone is making the argument that inflation is primarily a monetary phenomena, referring specifically to money, that's not a supportable argument in the modern era. As you can see from this, money supply bounces around, up and down, ranging in the case of M1 between negative in 2006 or 7 to 15, 20% in the decade that followed, and M2 wasn't as volatile as that, but it's not correlated either with the economy and has nothing whatsoever to do with the formation of inflation because there were no inflationary pressures at all in this entire period except for the housing inflation in 2005 and 2006. And you can see in those years that M1 was actually falling, the growth rate was falling, and M2 was rising, but it was rising modestly and was only at 5% which nobody recalls as inflationary or would think as inflationary. So using the money supply as our target variable is not going to work, one might think, because there's no clear correlation between that target variable and the goal variable, which is the economy we're trying to influence. This does not show any clear correlation. Now, we're not doing regression analysis here. here excuse me, regression analysis here to show that. But if we did, it would show that there's next to no correlation. So uh, even if it was lagged, it would show that there's next to no correlation. Because, look, you can't deny that these M1 measures especially go above 15% twice, and there was never a hint of inflation. Quite the contrary, it was a deflationary period in that era. Now, let's take a look at one more concept to drive this home. Here we're drawing upon an antiquated concept from the classics. This is from David Ricardo and, and the uh, economists of his era in the early 19th century. And so as they were beginning to speculate about the role that money actually has in the economy, they say, well, you get it, it's kind of a stock, right? Even if you're thinking about stacks of dollar bills, it's a stock. So how does that translate into impact in GDP? Well, through circulation. I spend it, you take it from me, you spend it, whoever took it from you spends it, all of that. And so they de define that rate of circulation as velocity. That's the term they use, velocity, monetary velocity. The exchange equation, which is the one there on the left, the equation of exchange, tells you or told you back then in that theory that the amount of money you have times its velocity, which is basically its annual turnover rate, if you're talking about an annual economy, is going to be equal to the aggregate level of GDP nominally in the economy. It's going to be the price level times real output. That's PY. P is the price level and Y is real GDP. In the modern context, people don't quite accept such a naive notion of money circulating kind of physically through the economy. But what remains of this concept is what is shown as the formulation on the right of the, the uh, definitions of the, or the equations, I should say. These days, they say, well, if you take GDP, which is nominal gross domestic product, and uh, divide it by the money supply, then the resulting value is based upon this tradition velocity. So what does velocity do? Uh, over time when you actually do this. Classical monetary theorists argued that if velocity was stable, if it was just kind of a constant, then all you had to do to control the growth rate of the money supply, to, the, excuse me, all you had to do to control the economy's growth rate is control the growth rate of the money supply. 
if velocity is stable. And so that was a theory that actually uh, held, was prevalent until the 1970s and even the 1980s. The belief that, yeah, if velocity is stable, then really all you have to do if you want to stimulate the economy is influence or decrease the money supply growth rate. Now, that was not associated with the group of economists who call, were called monetarists. Uh, they kind of accepted this general notion, but they felt that the money supply growth rate should be kept at a healthy constant and that the central banking authority, the Federal Reserve, should not try to stimulate the economy by using this equation of exchange. But there were others who argued, yeah, you can use it. And the Federal Reserve system never bought into the monetarist argument. They were always tinkering with ways to make the economy rise or fall. And all during the time I was in college and graduate school, the Federal Reserve system seriously pursued monetary target aggregates. I wrote my PhD dissertation on the, uh, the topic. My PhD dissertation was called The Choice of the Appropriate Monetary Aggregate. And the two aggregate names at the time I did the research for that was M1A and M1B, long which have uh, disappeared. And I argued, as the thesis of my dissertation crudely explained, that money no longer matters. It's not connected enough to the behavior of the economy for that to be a suitable target variable. So my dissertation rejected what's now M1 and M2 as a suitable target variable. But a lot of people, you know, sort of have this simplistic notion, and it's understandable that they do, that the Federal Reserve System creates money, and that's what makes the economy grow. And there's, you know, a half-truth to that. If they create a lot of money, the economy will probably have this little pop, but not in any reliable way. For monetary growth, however money is to be defined, to be an effective policy instrument to either stimulate the economy or cool it, velocity has to be a constant, or if it is trending, it has to be stable and predictable, which was a later argument that was made in the 1980s. So when we take a look at velocity, uh, M1 velocity is neither. You can see there going up, going down, although uh, fairly smoothly, and M2 is really pretty unstable and trending down. So if it's trending down, it's having less and less of an influence upon um, national spending, upon GDP, upon the level of aggregate demand, however you want to, want to state it. And, uh, and also, of course, it's long recognized that this is as much the effect as it is the cause of how people hold their money. Now, uh, and so this is calculated in this way. So this is more evidence. We don't have stability, that's for sure. And those trend lines are not actually uh, uh, trending down stably either. So this kind of sums it up. Uh, this is actually kind of a summary statement that's very, very generalized from my dissertation because my dissertation approaches this from uh, different angles. We're talking about something, by the way, written in 1980. Or, uh, it's become increasingly apparent that if efforts to control the money supply are less and less effective for at least three reasons. It is very hard to define what constitutes money. And so the definition keeps changing. As I said, there was an M3 about five years ago. There no longer is. When I looked into this, there was M1A, M1B, and there were interim definitions as well. If this worked well, why do they have to keep changing the money supply definition? They're changing it because they're trying to find something that is statistically correlated with economic growth. This is because consumers and businesses rely less and less on monetary holdings to finance our spending and in fact are reducing their monetary holdings in exchange for non-monetary financial assets and because they can use credit. And, re and so therefore point two is once you give somebody a credit card, this relationship between money and spending breaks down right there. But also most of us, and certainly American corporations, don't hold their liquid assets in non-interest-bearing cash form. They, even if for a short-run period of time, they convert those assets over to financial assets that are not monies, and so the measure of what is money goes down. Nobody uses time accounts or savings accounts anymore because they don't pay enough interest, and so they play less of a role. A lot of us do use money market mutual fund accounts that are checkable. I do, in the, but I don't use it for spending. It's in my 401k retirement account. I can't spend it, couldn't spend it if I want to. So therefore, the, as we use less and less of the official stuff that we used to call money, 
and substitute for that more and more highly liquid convertible financial assets like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs, then the relationship between money and spending just decays over time. Credit and the availability of credit is more reliable. Credit is borrowed money. Credit is a flow variable and debt is the stock variable that results from credit accumulating over time. So the net delta, the change in credit, is equal to credit extended over any time period such as one month. Debt is in the balance, credit is addition to the balance. So credit actually is going to be one of our primary candidates for the actual target variable. Credit growth is more correlated to GDP behavior than money supply growth. We'll also discover quite a bit later on, though, that interest rates typically, although not always, are even more connected. And so interest rates will be the primary target variable used presently, for example, by the Federal Reserve System. So the money supply growth rate, although interesting, is a bit antiquated and is certainly not an effective means to pursue policy today. Now, you've seen this before. I want to remind you of this before we white, uh, uh, wrap up here. This is a graph we've looked at at least twice in the class before. This is the total indebtedness of all parties divided by national income. And so, of course, what we're saying is this is our capacity to pay the debt. And I've explained in this what I mean by stability of the 80s, the silver credit and the like. I'm just reminding you that we're kind of going back to this standard now as we explore the effects of open market operations. We even looked at this and I updated it. Now, the thing that's really rising is the one on the far right called federal government. And that, of course, is going up at a staggering pace right now. This is in the trillions. So the total amount of debt we owe in this economy is $54 trillion, of which when this was uh, drawn into the data, which was at the end of, two th that should be, sorry, that should not say 2020 Q4, it just caught my eye, that should say uh, 2019 Q4. This was drawn out of the March 20 um, flow of funds accounts, but it refers, of course, not to 2020 Q4, sorry, but to 2019 Q4. And so the big one is the federal government. Of course, that is what's going to grow by about $3 trillion probably this year alone, or at least $2.5 trillion. Now, you know, it's easy to criticize the government. It just so happens, see that car right there? It just was released. It's a Koenigsegg Jumeirah electric hybrid. It's a 2020 version. It's beyond anything you've ever seen. It's actually an electric car that has nonetheless a 600 horsepower engine that you can start up to help it accelerate if you need to go from 0 to 60 in 1.9 seconds, which this car could do. And I want one. And the only way I can get it is if I use debt because the car costs $2.3 million. And once again, old story, my wife won't let me do it. So, but if I, uh, you know, if she wasn't so restrictive, I might consider borrowing money and buying it. So down there, when we look at the consumer credit, uh, which is next to home mortgage debt and all that, um, second one, actually consumer credit's not very high. We sometimes behave a little bit like our federal government. Okay, we're now ready to go into open market operations. We'll begin with a simple example that you absolutely must strive to understand. The example being simple, though, is accurate. It's the way it actually is done. Then in the lecture that follows that, we will refine it and make it more modern and make it more realistic. So that's the promise of what we have ahead. And so we'll see you in the next video.